Welcome. It's great to have you all here and be a part of Expo 2024. I'm really excited about this panel. And I'm going to start us off with a little story just to, to position us. So late November 2023, I was going out for dinner with some friends. And I, it was a Japanese restaurant in this plaza where there's a longos, great big longos in Oakville. And I got out of the car and I saw this bank of shiny chargers. And I got so excited. And my, my dinner friends were wondering why I was running around the parking lot in a very cold night taking pictures. And I emailed my work. And I said, oh, you wouldn't believe it. This bank of chargers is going in. And it's so cool. And I got this very, very like, yeah, Emma, they're coming to the Expo 2024. <laughs> so anyways, very excited to see the chargers going in at the Longos near me for a multitude of reasons. But even more excited to get to talk today about how it happened and, and why um, Longos made such a good use case for, for chargers. So thank you for being here. Thank you for and, having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And Deb, could you start us off, please, by just talking about how this partnership came to be? Who approached who? What went on behind the scenes? OK, I will. Is my mic on? Yeah. Um, so thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to talk about the story and how we got to where we are with having these charging stations in two of our locations now and more to come. So we're really excited about it. I have to give credit where credit is due. Dave Mastrioni, who is sitting in the audience and trying to avoid my eye contact right now, <laughs> he is the mastermind of this at Longos. Um, he is the one that, um, that created the relationships, built the relationships with Jewel, took a look at what all of our options were, and actually made intent turn into reality by having the stations put in. So I just have to give a huge amount of, um, of thanks and acknowledgement to Dave and all the work that, uh, that he has done on this. So. Where, how did we get here? So I guess the, the big thing is we're, we're really happy to support the infrastructure of the EV charging stations because we've always been focused on sustainability. It's something that matters to our guests. We call our customers our guests. And it's something that matters um, in a pretty significant way to our guests. We hear it from them in all of the things that we do to support sustainability. So this just felt like a no-brainer when this opportunity became available. It was more about how are we going to make this work and how is it going to make sense financially? How is it going to make sense um, accessibility-wise for our guests and for our, uh, for our team members? So, um, so other charging stations that we looked at, obviously they take a lot longer to charge. Our guest is in there as an, as, on an average maybe 30 minutes to do a shop. And so they were looking for options where they could come in and knock two things off their list. They could get their grocery shopping done, kind of like you. Going for dinner, <laughs> charging the car at the same time, perfect. If we can take advantage of that and make life a little bit easier for our guests by allowing them to charge while they are grocery shopping, that is perfect for us. So that was a big driver and the need that we had that we worked with, uh, with Jewel on. So, um, so, and I, th I think the other thing that appeals to us is that the battery charges, I will call it at low, um, low usage times. And then during the day, when our guests are drawing power off, those, uh, off the battery, you're not drawing it off the grid. So it's that, to us, makes a lot of sense environmentally and, sus and sustainability. The other thing it does for us is we are very focused on food waste and trying to eliminate food waste. And so if we do have a power interruption in the store, we can use that battery to charge, to keep the refrigeration, the, that kind of core refrigeration system going so that it can reduce food waste, which is something that really means a lot to all of us, obviously. So that was a huge part of when Dave uh, was, was talking to us about it as a broader team. We're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense as well. And we've talked about the power outage. We, how have we done it? We've done it by funding um, partnerships. So I think what we learned is that we don't have to do this all on our own, right? I think sometimes you look at an opportunity and you think, oh, I've got to do it from, from beginning to end. And I think what this provided with Vince and his team coming on board and working with us is we don't have to be the experts in charging stations. We, had, uh, we knew what we wanted to accomplish, but you partner with people who are good at that kind of thing and at that, that evolving technology. We don't have to be the experts. You just find really good partners who are the experts, and then it can happen. So that partnership, I think, to us was really, really important. And, um, and then we share in the revenue earned from the charging stations as well. But I think the, the prime driver for us is, again, that uh, being convenient for our guests. And then I'm going to finish up here, I promise. So um, we've got two stations, um, two locations that have the stations now. So our North, or North Oakville store, for anyone who shops there, and Markham. 
And then there's two underway, I believe, Rutherford and Winston Churchill are underway, and then we're looking at two more installations in the future. So this isn't a one and done for us. Um, I think this is something that's working really well for us and that we want to continue. And I'll finish there. <laughs> Thanks so much. So Vince, uh, Deb kind of flicked at, at the technology, but I'd love for you to, to get a bit deeper into it. The charging off-grid sounds positive. Um, so yeah, over to you to, to talk about the tech. Thank you uh, for having us. Uh, really. Glad to be here and uh, just to share a little bit about uh, eCamion is our corporate name, but Jewel is our brand, okay? Um, I think it's one of Canada's success stories and if you haven't heard about us yet, you will because it's an innovative technology. Oftentimes people say, well, if we're going to go with all these EVs that are out there, will the grid, will the electrical system be able to handle it? We don't have an, um, an energy problem, we have a power problem. And what that means is that when we get to electrification, if you have a charger at home and whatnot, you can do that overnight quite conveniently. But when you go to a grocery store or you're going somewhere for dinner and whatnot and you want to be in and out quickly, you need to have high power, high output chargers. And that's what Juul does. We use a proprietary technology using battery buffered storage. I don't want to get overly technical here, but we're able to provide that high power without having to rely on the utilities. And why is that important? Any other charger that goes out there to use uh, level three chargers, as we call it, at very high speeds, which could be at 150 kilowatts or 200 kilowatts, very high speeds, they would require uh, utilities to provide uh, upgrades, and that could be transformers, wires, substations, things of that nature. That can take anywhere from 6, 12, even 18 months. In today's society, we don't have time to wait. So with our deployments, in uh, many cases, like we've seen here at Longo's, we can do it within 6 to 8 months. Ironically, the one in Markham, we did in record time in less than 2 months. And that was, that was incredible. So the key thing here is that we're able to provide Canadians with fast chargers, reliable chargers, so that they don't have to worry about some of the topics like range anxiety and how do I get to you know, a fast charger. So that's very important to, to note. The other thing that I bring to uh, people's attention is internally we use the uh, expression that any other charger is a glorified extension cord that goes to the grid, right? With ours, we use that battery buffered technology. To Deb's point earlier, we have multiple things that we can do with that battery, whether we're backing up the store, whether we're doing energy arbitrage. We have the utilities that have come up with a great ultra low charging rate at 2.8 cents per kilowatt hour after 11 p.m. Well, we take advantage of it. With our software, we're able to have our chargers, uh, sorry, our batteries charge in the evening so that during the day, we are reliant just on our battery. So I think that that's probably um, you know, some of the key points with this technology. But like I said before, it's one of those Canadian success stories that you're going to hear more and more about us. So the, the battery, um, do you know roughly what the ratio is for the battery being fully charged and how many vehicles it could provide a charge to during the day? Well, interestingly enough, because our software controls when to charge from the grid and when we don't, we have yet to deplete any of our batteries. We have some of our stations within the GTA that can do anywhere from 40, 50, 60 cars a day and still not deplete the battery. So as I was saying before, because it's a proprietary technology, we're able to manage all those things. And what I want to point out here, it's a Canadian company. Everything is designed, manufactured, installed right here in Toronto. Great, thank you so much. So, uh, Pierre, you have experience with, with this sort of model of charging uh, infrastructure outside of Ontario. Um, could you bring in your experience in Quebec and also talk about the business case for a company like Longos to do this? Um, does it make sense? I know these are Canadian technologies and, you know, theoretically designed for, for life and, and use habits here, but does it actually make financial sense? A, the, the financial sense for the grocers, so first of all, you, my relation with grocers and green grocers, I just want to explain that I, my wife and I, we've established ourselves, we live next to Jean Talon Market in Montreal. In 2008, when I was the president of Earth Day Canada, 
We uh, build with uh, IGA banners with the owners uh, of the 250 at the moment. Now there's 290 stores at, uh, and uh, I've co-designed a fund that is uh, called the Fond Eco IGA. This fund has a dotation of $1 million for since 2008 and um, uh, a year, yearly uh, uh, endowment. And uh, this fund already we created, uh, we, we've donated or participate in distributing more than 100,000 rain barrel, 30,000 composter, 22 uh, workshop on food waste. And we, and Earth Day is still managing all the waste of all the IGA, the 290 stores with this program. And some of them have attained zero uh, zero waste into their stores. This, um, and on the 10th anniversary of this uh, fund, we created the first four uh, electrified zero emission refrigerated trucks in Canada and the first station of the EcoCharge. Meaning here to your question that for the grocers or the green grocers in my tribe, it's not about ROI, it's about doing the right thing. So, and the model, the business model is not, it's, it, it's not their priority. Of course, we bring a lot of, uh, a lot of, of people into the stores and for now this is where they're happy with. And then of course, the business model is going to mature in the year to come. Thank you. So that's really interesting that um, you think it's more a meeting of like-minded and like-valued companies and individuals coming yeah. together. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, at a, at a partnership level, what are the ingredients here to make this work? You know, Debbie already talked about how many stakeholders were involved. It wasn't Longo's alone having to become an expert in something that they're not an expert in. Right. So maybe you could start us off by, you know, what, what was the core partnership ingredient that you felt made it work? Um, I think the the core, what really got us started, I think, was that um, that staying true to our culture, which is so firmly rooted in sustainability, and knowing that we wanted to look at that in all facets of our operations. And then Dave, as I, I mentioned, Dave then saying, well, here's an opportunity that we've got here in the parking lot. So we always are so focused on what's going on inside our mm -hmm. stores. And then we're, we, we've got this really valuable asset to our guests in the parking lot. And how do we make better use of that and also support sustainability at the same time? So I think it had to start with that. It had to start with a commitment to being more sustainable and more environmentally responsible. And that has to be part of your, your DNA and, and part of your North Star as an organization. Because it wasn't easy for Dave to then go look for all the partners and then evaluate the partnerships, evaluate what the funding models could be. I'm sure lots of negotiations <laughs> with, uh, with our friends and our partners um, at, along the way and because it was so new. And so I think it's um, staying true to your North Star sustainability um, and then being patient, I think. Um, I didn't ask Dave for his thoughts on this, but I, I think if I were him, I'd say um, it's a lot of work and being patient, but knowing that you're going to keep negotiating and figuring out a way that it's gonna work for, for both of those parties. So, yeah, and then being comfortable, not knowing, every, having to know everything about it, right? Repro relying on your partners. Yeah. Vince, what do you think? So this is a, a great question, and I'll start by saying the following. It all boils yeah. down to trust, yeah. all right? Yeah. Number one is trust, and I know with Dave, and uh, shout out to Dave for all the hard work that he's put into this, is that when we kicked this off, if there wasn't an underlying trust, it wouldn't have got anywhere. And I joke internally because I will call Dave and we'll talk about different things on the charging network and he reminds me, he says, you know Vince, he goes, we do more than just charging at Longos. Uh, we get past that, but then he answers my questions. But the, the real thing here is that Longos customers are our customers and I often will be that mystery shopper. So I go to all the stations, I charge, I go into the store, I shop, I do all of those things. And I also want to make sure that the uh, employees at Longos know about the stations because any shopper that's in there might be inquisitive to say, well, how do they work? How much do they charge? And before we opened any of the chargers at the Longos locations, we do what I would call a mini training session. So we go and we continue to work on that trust. And the ability to continue to grow to all these stores that we talked about 
is a fundamental reason why that has worked. The other thing that I want to point out is that we want to bring the shopping experience to the drivers and inside the store so that it becomes a unique opportunity for both companies. And one of the things that we're working on, Deb, I hope you don't mind me saying this, yeah, is that we are going to connect the loyalty rewards program that's at Longo's, the thank you rewards program, so that shoppers can be rewarded when they're charging at our stations, go into the store and shop, and vice versa. You heard it here first. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, and Pierre, what do you think? The IG banner, as Longo's is, is a Sobe's banner. Yeah. Um, but the particularity of this banner, it, has, it is owned in a great majority, like 90% of the stores are owned by inde independent owners. So, um, and I really, truly love all of them. You know, this is kind of, this is, it's a, it's a businessman at the center of their community with the, the, the heart at the right place. So it's a privilege to work with them. And I would go with Vince, and that's the first thing, trust. Second, um, devotion. Third, attention to detail. And all of this, you better bring solution and not problem. <laughs> Yeah, the details are a really important piece of this. I mean, there's so many moving parts, so many variables. Um, so that's, that's a really good one. Um, okay, so Deb, we've, we've kind of, we've danced around a little bit why um, right. any company, but in your case, Longos, would, would commit to these initiatives. I mean, they are expensive, they are time consuming. Yeah, you get something um, that, that, you know, I think most of us in this room believe is, is the future. Right. But it's, it's a tough hill to climb at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to do this. And there is an argument that mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. But really, it does come down at the end of the day, does this make sense for our company? So how did Longos work that out? What was the mm -hmm. equation for why are we going to invest in sustainability? Right. Well, I think. Um, I'll go back a little bit. Um, one of the speakers on a panel that will be later on today is um, Chris Henry, who is at Purelater. I spent a lot of time at Purelater, loved the company. Um, Chris is amazing, so if you can catch his, uh, his talk, uh, try to do that as well. And I think what I learned from Purelater is um, the importance and the impact that you can have on the environment and on sustainability. Mm -hmm. And having that, again, that North Star to say, how can we do what we need to do um, to make this business work, but also do it in a way that is um, the, the best impact on our, the communities we serve, Pure Later across Canada. And, um, and so I had a really good grounding in it from my time at Pure Later in terms of understanding that importance. And then coming to Longos and then realizing and seeing the huge commitment that the Longos family has had before it was even cool to care about this kind of stuff. Um, right from day one, I think they have, uh, the Longos family has invested in areas that others probably hadn't or that were a bit ahead of their time. Our Stouffville store, as an example, is a zero footprint store. So between the solar panels, between the battery, the backup battery, battery generator um, and, and at the side, between the refrigeration equipment that we're using, zero footprint store. Um, our distribution center at our support center, solar panels um, on, on the roof of there. So our power source, right, that we can then either feed, feed back to the grid. And so, I, from inside and out and then I thought it stopped there but that as I got to know the Longos better and kind of dive, dove into it even more it's even about what we sell in our stores so the focus on local the focus on sustainably caught fish the focus on um, what we what we are store what we are selling in our stores I don't I can't think of one part of our business that we aren't always putting that environmental lens up to and again it's not always the financials that are driving that, it is often the passion that comes with saying this is the commitment we're making and then how can we make it work financially by finding partners, by sometimes just knowing it's the right thing to do and then seeing it prove itself out and then expanding on that later on. But I think to your point, Pierre, like it, it is something that does have to evolve and you just you do have to just have that strong belief sometimes. So Pierre, um, Drawing on, on the Quebec experience again, because those charges have been at the IGA for um, longer than uh, the ones at Longos, um, what's the data telling uh, you about how they're used? Are they successful? 
Um, is this a model that could be, can and should be replicated across Canada? Is there, is there anything you can tell us about the story the data is, is telling? So let's start. We have 103 port upper in operation right now. Within these, we have 102 from um, uh, ChargePoint CPA 250. My friends at ChargePoints are here. Hello. Um, we have one Shaivi from a uh, South Korean uh, charger. Uh, at this site also, we have another friend that is the reason why I, we're here. Is a, we have a bulk windshield washer uh, from EcoTank. And we are actually building 88 ports in 22 sites with Express Plus. So these are 200 kilowatt, two, two times 200 kilowatt per site. So I'll share, and I'm glad to share a couple of key knowledge, huh? because you have to understand, I, I come from the environmental side of it. Now I'm a businessman, and so there's an end. I've built a couple of things in my life, but not a network, so now. So one, one, the first one. 10 of our, our top 10 sites are doing twice, two and a half more business than the average of all our sites, including the 10 sites. Another one, and that's going to be a pre, you know, this is another one. Um, population density is way more significant in the health of the usage of your charger than accessibility or geolocation or next to a highway. The and this is kind of for the, uh, uh, the landowners here, it's not business as usual. You may think this is the right place to put them. I don't think so, okay? And then to this, if you have, if you are a policy maker, and this is a wish out of my knowledge, if you're a policy maker, you're an operator, you're thinking of installing charger in a densified area and let's say you have a hundred so a ratio of 75 percent of the of the car parked into the park lots that you have so let's say you have a hundred parking space and 75 clients that they come to your parking site please do not install level two chargers because as the EV grows, battery capacity increase, and demand to, be, to have a reliable, to, to have a success to be able to turn the corner, we need power in densified area. Right. So my, my takeaway from that is like the big, the big thing is don't provide like less charging. The, the trick is to provide the high power, is, is what the data is saying. There is a demand yeah. for people in densified area that is their primary source of uh, charging and availability is going to be, and they need power. And it's just the data. I'm telling you, I'm not saying this yeah. out of my end. Data is there. And if you have, if you're in a densified area, but it's not accessible versus you have an accessible how the highway but it's not where the people live choose the one where it's not accessible and provide power there because this is where people need power their demand is there and what about um and if and oops, if sorry, you put a level two charger then it's a, this is kind of, I have a situation, I know this, I have a situation where I have a, a parking lot that has least, he has 150 cars space, and it's about three or 400 cars a day that comes in. And the regulation was you need to install 10% of your charger, but they didn't make any difference between a level two. So imagine, I have a place where four cars are parking in that space, I'm going to use it for a level two and block the accessibility. I'm not going to serve any client there. So that is going to change, but the law is, I need to, ch I, so I'm, the law, the city of Montreal yeah. law is going to be changed because of this event. But it's kind of a, 
it's kind of a, this is a, this one of the same thing I want to share because this is definitely in Toronto. And again, it's for public charger in public parking space. I'm not talking about private parking space. What does the data say about the number of chargers? Is there a, is there a sweet spot in terms of how you, you cited the, a certain percentage, 10% of the parking spots <laughs> the, had to have them. Is that right, wrong? The sweet spot is about what you're going to get from the grid. It's all about going to be, for us, it's about what the grid is going to be able to power and how much, how fast the, 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 the utility is going to be able to connect me. I want to connect as fast. I don't mind to have uh, 300 amps or uh, 3,000 amps. If you give me 600 now, mm -hmm. and I'll install, I'll create the demand, and then in a later time, I'll grow the site, or I'll find a site next to it, because there's many other sites. It doesn't have to be all super 100 uh, charge at the place, you know? So this is kind of for us. For sweet spot, two charger of 180, uh, dynamic uh, charging uh, facility between these charger with two ports. I think this to start with, perfect. <laughs> Great, um, and then Vince, I wanted you to pick up the thread of what Pierre was saying about uh, the refueling station of the future sure. and what that will look like. Is it grocery stores? Is that gonna be the norm in 20 years or what kind of mix do you think we're going to see? For sure, that's a good question. But first, I want to just address to Pierre, if you have a power problem, Pierre, we can address it. We have the solution for you. We'll talk after this. But uh, I, I believe that the gas station of the future is not going to be what we have today. Okay, the gas station of the future. I, I joke with my kids as I'm driving in my electric car, and I said, you see that truck that's bringing all that fuel to the gas station? I said, my fuel is coming from all those wires that are up above. I don't have to go somewhere. So anywhere you have electricity, anywhere that there's adequate power is there. I believe that we're going through something called the paradigm shift. This is a 1990 term, but I'm going to bring it back up. Remember the days pre-cell phone? You're probably too young for that. Then we went to, you know, these box phones, flip phones, all the way to these smartphones. And back in the day, I worked for a telecom company and they said, we're going to move everything up to the cloud. We had no idea what they were referring to, but everything was going to be networked. At that point, we had a lot of naysayers and saying, well, what do you mean? How is that possible? Well, fast forward to 2024, nobody has CD players anymore. Nobody has to worry about music on their devices. They can just stream it. So that paradigm shift happened and has continued to flourish. The paradigm shift that we're going to see now is that these chargers are going to be ubiquitous. They're going to be everywhere, okay? The retail uh, scenario is going to be a very powerful one and a very positive one. Why? Deb mentioned this earlier. The dwell time for a charge is about 25 to 30 minutes, which mirrors exactly how much time customers are in a Longo's store or retail store, so it mirrors that. People are saying, well, I've got to go from point A to point B. There's a lot more planning that can take place. There are wonderful apps that will help you get from point A to point B so that you can meet all these, um, uh, reach your destination. But I believe by having enough of these stations, having partnerships that we're demonstrating today, it's going to be a different way that we work as drivers. Um, I personally don't have to fret about gas prices. I know just the other week we were all you know, in a tizzy about a 16 cent increase because of uh, uh, winter fuel going to summer fuel, which somebody please help me understand why that price ha changes overnight. But the point was my price remained consistent. I didn't have to worry. The other thing is that if we have charge stations at home, nine times out of 10, you'll be able to charge overnight and you'll be topped up. But for those times when you have to go shopping or things of that nature, they're available. One of the reasons why the Oakville store that we started with, the one that you brought up, is doing very well, it has three very vital points to a successful charging location. Number one, it's in a high density area that has a lot of condominiums, which most of those condominiums don't have enough power for electric car charging. So that's number one. Number two, it's close to a major highway, which it is the 407, not far from the QEW. So that's very important. And number three, there's something to do. 
We want the drivers to get out of their cars, go inside, shop, and complete that. Right now, there's been a lot of um, you know, issues from retailers to saying they're buying online, they're not coming into the store, and things of that nature. This affords the retailers one more way to get the customers back into the store. So I do believe that the retail is a form of gas station for the future, but I do believe that it's going to be ubiquitous. Anywhere there's power, there will be chargers. Yeah. So we have time to take audience questions in two minutes. Just bear with me, but I'll ask my last question and give you all time to prepare your thoughts. Um, the theme of this conference today is turning ideas into action. So moving forward out of the theoretical into the tangible real world. Based on the experiences you have all had, you know, for the people in the audience, what is the one takeaway you want them to have in order to be able to go back to their respective companies, fleets, places of business, and say, okay, like today is step one. Vince, you want to kick us off? All right, well, the thing I'm going to say is, is very simple. Uh, anytime I talk to people, friends, family, and they know I'm in the EV space and whatnot, they'll give me a, a, a myriad of reasons why this is not going to work, right? And they're challenging me about 2030, 2035, it really doesn't matter if it's 2036 or whatnot, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. This paradigm shift is not going to stop. And I do believe that if we get our minds around it, embrace it, right? You're not going to block this technology. It's happening. The other thing is get in an EV. A lot of times when I talk to people, I say, well, have you ever tried one? No. Well, how can you comment? Try it first and foremost. Number two, I've put this offer out there, and if anybody wants to see me afterwards, We'll, we'll loan you a car. We'll give you some ideas on how this works, but get yourself around that. Number three is big testament. Uh, Honda just announced a $15 billion investment in Alliston. So shout out to Ontario yet again. We have Stellantis, we have Volkswagen, now we have Honda. Let's see who number four is gonna be. So this is gonna be, I would say, one of those meccas for uh, electric vehicles. So it's here, embrace it, and try not to deny it. Great, Bev. Deb? Yeah, I can. I'll build on that. I think that uh, I think everything Vince says too. So, given that paradigm shift is coming and where it is underway, you've got to go where your customers are. You've got to go where your guests are. You've got to. You, they're going to drive us there, whether we want to believe it or not. And so, we better get ahead of it and figure out how we're going to do it and have it make sense from a business perspective. And I think the the takeaway I would suggest is uh, doing a lot of what um, Dave and our team did um, at Longos is explore those partnerships that are available learn I know that we have done it I've learned I can't even tell you how much I've learned talking to Vince just in the last couple of months about what we're doing and and about the technology so being educated about it and then being able to translate that into there's no business out there that doesn't have a huge amount of time they're spending on their sustainability efforts and their reports that they're putting out and so for us, it's about, okay, how does this help us in that sustainability and those commitments we're making? And I'm sitting here now thinking, okay, what's next for us, right? What about the, the, um, the, the trucks that are making our deliveries to our 38 stores every single day? How do you positively impact that footprint? So I think you've got to be looking in the future as well in all areas of your business as to where this may help. Pierre? Last word to you, Pierre. Yeah. Um, I think we're all, uh, and thank you, Emma. Thank you, yes, Deb. Yes, thank you, Vince, for in uh, electric autonomy for you know this this conference and uh, the the invitation. Also, I think we're all uh, people of action uh, here. But I want to remind you that um, transportation is the uh, single most contributor to greenhouse gas emission. Fifty-seven, five-seven. Companies emit 80% of the global greenhouse gas in the world. More than half of these corporations are related to uh, fossil fuel output. Or, this is my evaluation. The valuation of uh, the Parc Automobile is uh, right now $400 billion. More than, much more than the federal budget. In five years, this Parc Automobile is going to be on a way of valuation. Half is valuation to zero. 
This parc automobile sits 90% of the time doing nothing when 10% is spewing pollution while we are clogged on highway and uh, vociferating about the lack of funding from the federal government. This business is going to as a, as a sustained and sustainable headwind but there is no way we can fail because there is no image in this mirror. So I hope you're going to join me and boogie because it's electric. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. All right, happy to take questions now. I see a gentleman over here, go right ahead. Hi, um, so thank you for your uh, insights and support for electrification. I have a question for Deb. Um, so appreciate what you're doing at the store, retail store level. Uh, I get my Longos delivered by Voila um, and even Grocery Gateway back in the day. So I'm just curious as to what you're doing or planning to do as far as electrifying uh, the delivery fleet. Yeah. That, that is exactly what I'm, I think when I said I'm sitting here thinking about, okay, what's next for, for us? Um, we don't, uh, all of the former grocery gateway deliveries, they go through Fuala now. So um, I would expect that the Empire um, team is probably having a lot of these discussions and thinking about that in terms of the delivery. I'm sitting here thinking about the trucks that are going out to those 38 stores every single day and what kind of footprint um, we are leaving um, with, with all of those deliveries. But uh, yeah, I can't speak on behalf of what, uh, what the Empire team is doing. I don't know if Dave is working, is working with them on the, on the home delivery side though. Yeah, but it's gotta be something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. All right, go ahead. I wanna say hi. Um, is, this, is Mike working? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi Vince, I'm, I'm a big fan. I've worked with Vince in the past. I do some consulting for uh, fleet electrification. And I've been doing a lot of work with uh, microgrids in the, uh, recently. And when I see battery storage in the grid, I see a huge value asset. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit more, both Deb and Vince, how you see that as part of your business model, having these, these batteries on the grid that can both store the energy but also deliver it when needed to the grid, because that's a big part of our electrification future. Yeah. Yeah. I can start. So um, you're forcing me to tell more of our company's secrets. Uh, Hamanchu and Carmen, I hope you don't mind. But um, you hit on a very important topic, microgrids. So as we layer these batteries throughout a utilities network, throughout a province, a state, because we are across North America, these batteries, when not in use, can provide extra power, extra energy back into the utility. So that when we have high peak days, usually in the summer when the air conditioners are running hard, the refrigeration, the freezers are working extra hard, we can tap into those batteries. And the more batteries we have, the more flexibility the utilities will have. So I call our technology, and I know Hamanchu doesn't like this term, but I'm gonna use it anyway. It's the Swiss Army knife of energy management. So we talked about car charging, we talked about energy arbitrage, now we're talking about microgrids. We haven't even talked about you know, um, demand charges, we haven't talked about you know, some of the um, carbon credits that are available here, but there are many, many things that are available here. But from a microgrid perspective, they bring in another value that will just help our uh, electrical grid. I, I can jump in on, um, I think, I, I, we're excited about that. I don't, I'm not gonna pretend to know the technical stuff about microgrids that, uh, that Vince does, but I can say, even with the solar panels that we've had on the roof of our distribution center for 10 years, um, that was our way of then pr providing that power back to the grid when it needed it, right? We didn't always need it to power ourselves, and so it's about providing it back to the grid, and so this feels like the next step on that journey that I think we get really excited about. I just want to add one thing. You just yeah. trig triggered yeah. something here. We launched a new site in Mount Kisco, New York, so in New York State, which we call uh, uh, EV to Sunshine, or Sunshine to EV, sorry. And what we did there, on a courthouse, we put all solar panels that charge the batteries, which inevitably charge vehicles. So that is super cool, because we don't even go to the grid. That is neat. Um, I'm happy to, oh, go ahead. Another question? Ooh, in the nick of time. Yeah. Uh, question just regarding your high density um, locations right now, and you mentioned Oakville, Stouffville, Quebec. 
Are you seeing a direct correlation on increased revenue and in basket size specific to now implementing chargers? That's a great question. I would say it's still early for us to know because we've just uh, had it for a couple of months in the North Oakville store. And the Markham, I think, is just brand new. So, so we are looking. But what I like about what um, Vince talked about in terms of tying it to our loyalty program, we will be able to see the basket size and the, the spending habits of the people who are charging and coming into the stores. But we just we don't have that data yet. But it's got to be the right thing to do, right? It's got, it's got to be driving. So I think there's that belief then that that hypothesis and then we'll prove it out with the data as we get more of the data in. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Great give question. You, I'll give you just a qualitative analysis when I go and I'm the mystery <laughs> charger at these stores. I love yeah. to see the Longos bags in people's hands that are filling their trunks. So I think that qualitatively it's there but we will get some quantitative data very shortly. There's going to be a correlation for sure. So I have quantitative data, and the answer is yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Do you want to expand on that at all, Pierre? <laughs> like, y yes and what? Like, <laughs> yeah, I love that. I don't know if I can go further okay. than that. No, no, but I can give you, uh, it's a majority, uh, new customers, more sales, and a, a large majority of walk-ins. Well, great question. It's a good insight. Um, okay, well, I'm, I also have more questions. I fibbed earlier. I still have a long list. So um, if anyone has any last questions, feel free to come to the mic. Otherwise, um, I'd love to get all of your thoughts, actually, on um, the issue of charger maintenance. I'm endlessly curious about these chargers, and they're in the Longos parking lot, but they're jewel chargers. Who is responsible for these? Well, okay, I, I'm going to start with this one. This is a great, great question. One of the criticisms that a lot of uh, charger operators get, and you can just check uh, apps like PlugShare and whatnot, I go to the charger and it's down. Uh, one of our founders is an engineer and uh, he makes it a point every morning at 8.30 we have a production call. One of the things that we validate is that all the charge stations are working. If they're not working, we don't wait a day or two days or a week to get it solved. We do it immediately. Because one of the things that's important to us is we go back to that word trust. If the Longos customers, or they may not be Longos customers, go to our chargers and they don't work, what's the point of having them there, right? So we want to make sure that the uptime is maximized to the most of our ability. And we are ultimately responsible because it's our brand, because it's our technology, um, that we make them available to consumers. If they don't work, we have a 1-800 number, it's MAN 724, and we act on it. Great. What's been the IGA experience? We are, uh, we're responsible for made is ad financing and maintaining. The only thing we ask is not to, for the owners to check every day that you know, there's no vandalism or, and we, we ask them not to use salt in, uh, while, uh, snow removal. Right. And I'm going to say something I'm totally, uh, I like to be against the current. I think uptime is, is overrated. Um, I think what you want is the ability to be charged when you come to a site. So if you have enough station that are working and not is not, one is not working, this, I meaning there's kind of a if you have an overpowered station that three power module or not, I think this is kind of a, this is, it's still, there's a lot of conceptual, you know, ideas that we try to hold on to, but everything for me is fluid. I don't know how it's going to work. Who knows then, you know, that's my, but that's just kind of me answering your question yeah. uh, on the spot. Yeah, I've, I've heard it both ways. You know, it's, it's about uptime, you want 99.9% .9 or, you know, you want redundancies. I don't think, I agree. I don't think anybody knows yet. They're just trying to, to navigate their way. But this has been a really great discussion to understand how, you know, this partnership came to be and, and what the future might look like. I'm very excited by electric Longos trucks. I'm, <laughs> I hope that we can have you back and talking about that in the next few years. But thank you all so much, thank Pierre, Deb, much. and Vince. It's been great chatting with you. And thank you to the audience for your questions and attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.